So I'd like to introduce Rebecca Giblin. Unfortunately, um, Professor Giblin is unable to join us, but we'll be live somewhere on the video. Um, bear with me. Uh, so Professor Giblin is an ARC Future Fellow and a professor at Melbourne Law School and the director of the Inter Intellectual Property Research Institute of Australia. Her work focuses on diverse range of topics, the legal and social impacts of library e-lending projects, my, my passion personally, uh, how fuller protection of creators' rights can help them get paid and simultaneously reclaim lost culture, access to knowledge and culture. Technology, regulation, and copyright. Professor Giblin also leads the ARC-funded Authors' Interest, as well as Untapped, uh, the Australian Literary Heritage Project. Her new book, Trope Point Capitalism, which we'll be giving away as charity raffle prizes with Corey Doctorow, explores how we will recapture creative labour markets uh, from big tech and big content to get artists paid. So I will pass you on to Rebecca Giblin. Thank you. Creators aren't getting paid. That's because powerful corporations have figured out how to create choke points that let them snatch up most of the value generated by creative work before it reaches creative workers. I'm Corey Doctorow. And I'm Rebecca Giblin. Our new book, Choke Point Capitalism, pulls aside the veil on the tricks big tech and big content use to lock in users and suppliers, eliminate competition, and ultimately shake down creators and producers. We also share tons of ideas for how we can recapture creative labour markets to make them fairer and more sustainable. Margaret Atwood says, we tell how the vampires crashed the party and provide protective garlic. But don't take her word for it. Check out our extended video or read the book for more. Okay, I think I'm on. Am I on? Hi, everybody from Austin. Um, I came here for South by Southwest, which is uh, incredible. If I'd known to to dream that I could speak at South by Southwest, I would have had that dream, but I lacked the imagination even to think that it could have been possible. So it's been amazing. I had uh, every intention of being back on a plane on Monday and coming to join you live in Melbourne. Um, I live and work on the unceded land of Wurundjeri people about a kilometre from where you're all sitting right now, but the universe has other plans. So uh, instead I am here at almost midnight, but super excited to talk to you uh, about the ideas in this book and how it came about. Um, uh, I want to first of all do uh, acknowledge the um, the elders um, of the Wurundjeri people, past and present, as well as any First Nations people here with us today, um, and also to acknowledge everybody fighting to restore lost knowledge and language and culture. So this book was uh, born um, in a taxi between St Kilda and the city um, in February 2017. Corey had come over for a book tour and we we're doing an event together. We really didn't know each other very well at that point. He, you know, we knew, we knew each other to pass. He'd blogged about some of my research before. But it was really in that taxi that we we realized that we had this this shared vision. Like we were both, you know, between us, we've worked in this space for, you know, something like four decades. So we're veterans of the copyright wars, um, which, you know, have some intersection with the culture wars. And we were just so tired and frustrated. And we were tired and frustrated because we were sick and tired of being told that we have to choose between big tech and big content. And so if you want, um, you know, if you if you want exceptions that work, if you want, um, you know, the, the ability for 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 people to have choice, um, that means that you hate artists and you want them to starve. Um, but um uh, and, and, and vice versa. So we just we were just not accepting this false dichotomy, and what we were what we realized that we had this shared understanding that um, that no matter which of those sides that you chose, it was always not going to work because at best what you were going to do is pick the giant who and um, who, who, whose crumbs were going to fall from the table. And what we discovered was this shared vision where we didn't want to have any giants, where we wanted the people who actually made um, um, 
made the things and provided the services that give us value were able to share fairly in the rewards of their work. So that was 2017. We're both super busy. Fast forward uh, three years and um, I'm locked in my apartment. I was almost this day to the date, I think. Um, and while, of course, uh, that was in a, in, in a lot of ways, that was um, the opposite of freedom, but I decided to take it as a, a moment of freedom because usually my my work schedule is like filled up, you know, a couple years in advance and I've got, um, you know, I write a grant application. I say what I'm going to do four years from now. Um, but COVID threw all of that up in the air and I got to cancel everything and ask myself the question, what do I most want to work on right now? What's the story that I need to tell? And straight away I knew it was the one about how big business has um, stolen creative labor markets and all that we can do to take them back. Um, and so I start working on this and I, um, I, I get like a couple of weeks in and it's so exciting and exhilarating, but it's really, really hard because yes, I'm locked in my apartment. I haven't got any of those corridor conversations that I might usually have at university where I work at the office. Um, but also I'm just arguing with myself and I'm covering all of these things that I really haven't covered before. And so my brain one day was just like, you know what would be better? if Cory Doctorow wrote this book with me. Um, and, you know, that's actually, so I, I sent him an email. I said, hey, Cory, do you want to write this book with me? Um, and that's the thing you can do. You can write to Cory Doctorow and say, write a book with me, and he'll say yes. Um, he absolutely hates it when I make this joke um, because uh, he says, and, and if he was here, he would just like, do not write to me, please don't do that. But um, it, it just happens that, you know, Corey writes when he's anxious and he's now got seven books coming out. So this was a really good time to kind of get onto him and, um, and to start figuring this out. So that was my lifeline to the outside world during that um, long Melbourne um, six lockdowns working with Corey to like figure this out and to, to really unpack all of these different creative labor markets, see what was going on. Cause we were more familiar with some than others, you know, particularly the book markets we know a lot about, we really got into the nitty gritty of other things. And then we realized, hang on a minute, they're all using the same playbook. And so I'm going to start uh, today by telling you um, one of the most egregious stories that illustrates this playbook, and that's around Audible Gate. And I'm not sure how many of you in the room here have, have heard of that scandal. It should be that we've all heard of it, but um, uh, it, it didn't get quite quite that that degree of um of, of of scandalousness where we were all talking about it, but enough people were talking about it. I'm going to tell you what happened. Okay. So Audible, lots of you will know Audible. Tons of you will be subscribers to Audible, and there's really good reasons for that. It is by far uh, the most dominant uh, ebook. Um, oh, sorry, audiobook supplier in the English language world. Um, it tries to treat its customers very well, so you get um, you get little perks if you're an ongoing subscriber. And one of the perks that you get offered um, is that, you know, there was this very, very generous, no, no questions asked returns policy. So you could buy a book with your monthly credit and then um, you could return that book for a new credit, no questions asked. And Amazon um, would, you know, give you a lot of opportunities to do this. So they would send you an email after you finish the book, or they would like put it in their sort of um, their, their regular newsletter emails that have it listed on their website. Very easy to do, like one kind of click. Um, they would little, bring pop up up after you finish reading the book. Um, so there were lots and lots of opportunities to do this, and a lot of people did it. They started treating uh, their audible um, their audible libraries as if they were. Um, like library books, um, borrow a book, return a book. And what they didn't realize, because um, Audible kept this part very quiet, is that each time they did return a book, and they could do that, you know, even if they'd, in, they'd read the whole book, they'd loved it, um, they'd had it on their device for like up to a year, they could still return it for a full credit, no questions asked. But what they didn't realize is that when they did that, the full royalty was being clawed back from the independent writers who used the ACX platform to get their books onto Audible, which were a, a, a really big part of the market share as well as some smaller publishers. Um, and so this this was part of a bigger scam, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you how it got unwound. Um, so that 
it, it, it was becoming more and more prevalent over time so that um, authors started noticing that there was something really weird going on with their sales. So they were producing these books, like very expensively in some cases, it can cost, you know, 10,000 US dollars or more to produce a high quality audio book. They were being well reviewed, um, but the sales were really dropping compared to what they used to be. And some authors like Susan May, who's a Perth-based writer, they were thinking, you know, we think something's up with the returns, right? But they couldn't really find that out because Amazon and Audible, notoriously secret companies, and they refused to report to authors on what their returns and their sales were. Instead, they would only report on net sales. So it was one column instead of a column that said, here are the amount of books you sold, here are the number of books that were returned, and here's your net sales. You just got the net sales with all of the rest hidden in the background. Um, when people like Susan tried to get onto Audible to, to ask for the breakdown, they just kept getting stonewalled. Um, no matter what they did, they couldn't get this information. But then one day, October 2020, there was a reporting glitch and three weeks of returns data suddenly came up in a single day. And authors were saying, hang on a minute, like I'm having like dozens or even hundreds, thousands of books being returned and the scales were lifted from their eyes. A, a spotlight was shone um, into what was going on here and people finally understood the scope of the problem. Um, so why could Audible be so abusive? You know, why were they able to get away with this for so long? Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about what happened, what happened next, but, but how did they do this in the first place? Well, Amazon is the master of this playbook. They really pioneered it. They made it into a fancy diagram and they really love to boast about it. Um, so we, Corey and I made another little video, which is to um, unpack how Amazon explains these tactics, which it calls its flywheel, and then explain what we think is really going on. So we're going to show that now. Here's how Amazon describes its flywheel. Lower costs lead to lower prices, which create better customer experiences, translating to more traffic, which then attracts more sellers and thus a better selection. That improves the experience even more and the cycle continues. Amazon calls this a virtuous cycle, but it's not virtuous, it's anti-competitive. Here's what's really going on. Amazon's strategy has always been to lock in its customers. One way it does this is by putting digital rights management on ebooks and audiobooks, which cements readers to Kindle and Audible. Another is by offering fast free shipping to Prime members. Once you pay your annual fee, Amazon becomes your default whenever you need to buy something. Locking in its customers lets Amazon lock in its suppliers too. Publishers and small businesses can't afford to give up access to Amazon's increasingly large share of the market. So they keep listing their goods there, even when that's bad for their business long term. Amazon's lower cost structure is just a euphemism for shaking down its suppliers and workers. Amazon uses its market power to demand steep discounts and high fees from those other businesses as a cost of selling on its platform. It uses that money to subsidize low prices which has the effect of eliminating competitors who actually pay fairly. As time goes on, that means Amazon suppliers have even less choice. Those low prices also lure more customers who then get locked into Amazon's platform as well. The shakedown grows more merciless and damaging as Amazon's flywheel spins faster and gains ever more momentum. Okay, hi. So that's the playbook. Um, that's what's going on. Um, all of the companies that we look at in, in, in the course of the book are doing exactly the same thing, where they're locking in their, their users, locking in their suppliers. Um, they're able to do this because they get lots of sweet, sweet VC dollars with the promise that they will choke point their industries that allow them to throw at sweeteners, you know, to, to, to be attractive to the customers and then to be attractive to the businesses, but also to eliminate competition. 
you know, Amazon spent $200 million in a single month um, when diapers.com uh, looked like it might be some kind of threat in the, the nappy market. And that sounds like an expensive um, way of cornering the market for nappies, but it's a very, very cheap way of sending a signal that you will do a scorched earth approach to anybody who dares to impinge on on what you think is your space. And what that means is that, um, that, that venture capitalists will not enter the kill zone of Amazon and these other giants because they know that the, the big risk is that they will lose everything um, if Amazon decides that their toes have been stepped on. But why are these companies able to choke point these markets? The whole, you know, say what you like about capitalism, but competition is supposed to be fundamental to it, right? There's supposed to be a free exchange between buyers and sellers. But what we've seen over the last 40 years is a systematic project to eliminate competition and to enable these choke points to form. Um, that came about um, thanks to a, a radical reinterpretation of the origins of um, U.S. antitrust law in particular by somebody called Robert Bork. Um, he came along, he was a bit of a revisionist, and he said, no, 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 um, despite all evidence to the contrary, Congress wasn't really concerned about monopolies um, when it passed this antitrust legislation. It was concerned about consumer welfare. And what that means, um, in a nutshell, there's a little bit more nuance, but this is the vibe of it, um, is that the, the question about whether antitrust law or competition law should get involved depends on whether um, the, 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 the change is likely to um, have adverse effects on consumers. So, for example, is it going to make the prices go up at the checkout? Now, that's a reason where anti that's a, a situation where competition law would still intervene. What, of course, that did is that it in and, and, and um, so first of all, I'll say what what, what that was accompanied by was um, we, we got rid of the general suspicion of big companies and the general idea that being big was you know, likely to lead to abuses. And instead, we adopted these notions that, well, if they're very big, they're probably very efficient, right? And we don't need to worry about them being big because if they become big and they get a temporary market advantage and then they make more profits, then that will attract, attract competitors into the market and that temporary market advantage will be competed away and everything is rosy. Okay, but of course, that's not what happens because this this project um, to eliminate competition has been about figuring out ways in which to to convert those supposedly temporary market advantages into much more enduring ones. And they say the quiet part out loud. You know, there's a shamelessness to it. Peter Thiel comes out and says competition is for losers. Like, why would you get into a market where you have to compete? Um, Warren Buffett um, salivates over companies that have what he calls wide sustainable moats. All right. So in other words, barriers that stop new competitors from entering into the market. And that's what we mean when we talk about the choke points in choke point capitalism. Um, I should mention that these are caused not just by monopolies, but also by monopsonies. Um, this is not a sexy word, monopsony, um, and it's a little tricky sometimes for people to get their heads around because we don't have a, a family destroying board game for that one. Um, but a monopoly is like the flip side to, oh, sorry, a monopsony is a flip side to a monopoly. A monopoly is where you've got sellers who are very powerful, um, and a monopsy is where you've got buyers who are very powerful. And so since there's an Australian audience, maybe the most accessible um, um, example of this is the supermarket duopoly, Coles and Woolies. If you're um, a, a food manufacturer or a food supplier, you're the seller, but you don't have very much power at all, right? And unless you're Nestle or one of the other enormous multinationals, your bargaining power um, in relationship to Coles and Woolworths is very small. They are very powerful buyers. Um, when you think about the consumer welfare standard for a moment, and we see, well, pretty much under this new way of looking at uh, competition law, the only way you're going to get in trouble is if you raise prices for consumers. Then, of course, the obvious and very rational thing to do is to look to the other end of the chain and find ways to squeeze your workers and your suppliers. And um, that, um, 
uh, that's what you know what we we know about monopsony is that that it is the most dangerous thing for workers far more dangerous for workers than monopoly is um but the the evils of it are really um, have been very poorly understood because while we've all been looking over here at consumer welfare, everybody over here has been squeezed. But of course, when you're getting this downward pressure on your wages or the money that you can bring in um, for your products and your services because you're having to deal with a very powerful buyer, um, it has exactly the same end result as raised consumer prices because you've got less and less ability to buy the goods and services that you need. And we're really feeling that at the moment. Inflation is so high. What we're seeing is that corporations are passing that on and then padding a bit of extra to, to increase their profit margins um, so that, that we are still getting the raised consumer prices. But at the other hand, because they're so powerful as buyers of labor, then they're also um, depressing prices at the other end. And that's one of the reasons why we're all feeling so squeezed. So, in choke point capitalism, when we started looking at these um, at these different industries, we saw that industry after industry was um, affected um, by this 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 same playbook in similar ways. The tools used to achieve the choke points are different. So things like digital rights management, um, um, accumulating vast reservoirs of copyrights that then you know last for you know, 70 years after the author dies or, you know, 95 years for a sound recording, which you can then use to control the, the future of the industry. We saw vertical integration and uh, where you you um, buy up everything in the value chain, like for, for uh, online ad markets and horizontal integration where you buy up all your competitors that are selling the same stuff. Um, uh, and, and tool after tool, choke point after choke point, um, it's happening everywhere. Now, when they succeed in choke pointing a market, even though it might look a bit different, it always results in the same thing. And Corey has uh, coined a new term for this, which I really love, in shittification. Um, he did this in an, an instantly uh, classic um, pluralistic column and it became published on Wired as well. And what he explains is that, first of all, platforms direct their surpluses to users, right? Like I was talking about before, they want to be as attractive as possible to users. You get the users there because once the users are there, then the suppliers have to be there because that's where they access their audiences. And you really want to get the suppliers in too. So at the start, you direct your your surpluses to, to them as well. You've, you've been attractive to the users. You know, your Facebook, for example, you um, make sure that the users can easily connect to their friends and family and like people they want to stalk that they went to high school with a long time ago. And then they make it easy to be able to see the updates from those. But then you start changing it so that the business customers, um, they're, able to, they're able to also use this as a tool for reaching their customers. And maybe it's a little bit easier for their messaging to get out there than it is the individual messaging to get out there. So everybody rushes to Facebook and is super excited about this new way of communicating. And then the advertisers come on board and uh, you, you, this is the intrudification, right? You see less and less as a user, you see less and less of the, 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 the content from the people that you actually care about and even the businesses that you go to, and you see more and more material um, from, from these random advertisers. The surplus is, is moved away from the users, away from um, the, the business customers, and then into directly into the pockets of investors. And the aim within Shittification is to make the service, make the platform as bad as you can, but just before the line where people just throw up their hands and give up on it altogether. Um, we're seeing it play out in real time with Twitter at the moment. Elon might be a little bit on the wrong side of the line. I don't know how you're experiencing this, but um, it's a very weird vibes there uh, lately and the sort of tumbleweed kind of uh, situation. Um, so maybe it's, 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 it's died the shittification death. All right. Um, so we focus on the creative industries in the book, but choke points and intuitification uh, everywhere. And I do invite you to uh, adopt that term to name it and spot it whenever you see intuitification. Um, it's certainly coming to my mind a lot. But that's the problem. Right. The, the problem is these choke pointed industries. But what I want to talk about today uh, with you is the much more interesting um, point of what we can do about it. Right. Um, 
we were determined when we sat down to write this book that it was not going to be yet another chapter 11 book, right? Like we've all read them. There's 10 chapters on how terrible everything is, like set out in excruciating detail. And then a final chapter where, oops, we don't really, we've run out of time. We don't have really any uh, space to look at solutions, but a bit of sort of generalized hand waving and some advice, like maybe vote harder. This is not one of those books. And I should say, um, we were actually really surprised. You know, we've had an amazing reception to this. Um, he- heard from a lot of readers, particularly on social media. But um, a-, a-, a whole bunch of people have called out the first half and they've, they've said, like, how, like, rage-inducing it is, utterly rage-inducing. And I actually, I honestly didn't expect that because I've worked in this space for so long that uh, so I was just sort of, I guess I've just become inured to it. But then people just saying, like, they're, they're like, rage crying and like throwing the book against the wall or like worst worst putting it down and not picking it up because they just can't bear to read anymore and that's particularly the people the creative workers who knew that their sector was bad but then to to pick that up and see how systematically this shakedown is happening across um, all of these different markets is the thing that kind of drives them to despair. So if you've started reading the book and you've gone, oof, this is a despair book, um, I would encourage you to keep reading because the whole second half is where we get to the solutions, which is really what I want to focus on today. And um, what what I want to be sort of picking at is this idea that the open ethos has a lot to teach us about how we can defeat choke point capitalism. So let's look um, at a few of those um, those different ways in which can, we can take inspiration. And I'm going to be talking about it again in the context of the creative industries, but also invite you to think about more generally how this ethos can um, help us uh, in the project to defeat corporate concentration and choke point capitalism more generally in, in other areas. I want to start with transparency, um, which is obviously one of the the core values of the free and open source software movements um, by the ability to um, to to view and and study code, and also you know a big part of the open education movement, open government, open data, all everything open. And so this is where I'm going to come back to that Audible Gate story. When that data glitch um, happened and the the authors finally saw what was going on, that was the thing that they needed, the catalyst that they needed to be able to do something about it. So before this happened, um, they suspected something was up, but you can't fight an enemy if you don't know what it looks like. Right? It was really hard to mobilize any kind of resistance. And as I said, um, Audible and Amazon are deliberately secretive and they were definitely not, um, um, they were definitely hiding this uh, deliberately from authors. But once, once we got even just that small uh, light shone on the, the situation, the three weeks of return data, authors were able to mobilize and organize and to begin resisting. And they created this campaign, which was really um, effective, that um, drew attention to these abusive practices. Um, Also, you know, once once it became clear that this was what was happening with the the, the returns, um, one of the authors that was involved in this campaign, Colleen Cross, who's a former forensic accountant turned writer of um, forensic fraud thrillers, um, she started thinking, well, you know, if they're doing that to us on returns, what are they doing to us um, when it comes to royalties? And so she started digging into the contracts, which again, uh, you know, um, are deliberately opaque and confusing. And she worked out that actually... Um, Audible couldn't be paying independent authors what they were supposed to be paying independent authors because the, the numbers just didn't add up in a way that that, that could have been plausible. And so, um, you know, we talked to her um, in the course of writing the book. We asked her what was at stake here, like what kind of money we were talking about. And she's estimating hundreds of millions of dollars on the return scam alone. And then there's an enormous amount of wage theft that she thinks go- is going on on top of that. Um, we still don't have any real answer about the wage theft. Like she, she thinks, according to her, the best information she's got, that up to 87% of the money paid for these um, the, to access Audible books is going to the platform. So just 13% to the the author, um, the independent author who's also the publisher, who's also invested in making that audio book in the first place. Now, we don't really know if that's true or not because Amazon Audible won't make that information public. 
And why won't they? Because fuck you. That's why. They don't have to, right? And they benefit from that lack of transparency. Um, and it's not just them. It's the major streaming platforms and the big three record labels who control almost 70% of the global recorded um, music industry. And they own the three music publishers who um, control almost 60% of global song rights. I was at a panel at South By yesterday where um, the songwriter Autumn Rowe was there and she'd been preparing for this. She was digging into her royalty statement um, it was 3,000 pages long and like utterly incomprehensible. She said she kept looking at it and like trying to find out well, what, you know, okay, that many units, what's a unit? There's nothing on this that says what a unit is. Contacting the other people that are going to be on the panel saying, well, what is a unit? And like, there must be a key here somewhere. Just opacity um, for opacity's sake, because when there is opacity, then people can't find out if there is a mistake. Um, and then that operates obviously to the benefit of these corporations. So the fact that all of these companies throughout the creative industries do not adequately and transparently report to creative workers on what are essentially their paychecks and you're told to just trust them, like that's really kind of incredible when you think about it, particularly when we see that there's this extraordinary history of, of mistakes and of deliberate fraud. Um, you know, when the when the Beatles were playing, they had a terrible record contract at the start. They had to split a penny per album between the four of them plus their manager. Um, and then uh, they were still, and, and they had all kinds of deductions on top of that. And then the, the record plant was still running like a third shift where they would make a, a whole bunch of other records that they didn't even have to pay that tiny royalty on. So we know that these frauds happen and we need transparency to, to do something about it. And here, um, it, I always think of the, the artist Molly Crabapple um, when she talks about what opacity does. And she says, not talking about money is a tool of class war. Like a, a, a culture that forbids employees from comparing salaries helps companies pay women and minorities less. And it helps them pay everybody less if their if their project is to maximize value for their um, for their shareholders, um, and that's what it takes. Um, it's extraordinary. Um, we looked when we were researching this. We came across one LA-based um, auditing firm that had done tens of thousands of audits, uh, mostly of, of of record labels, and in those tens of thousands of audits, they had only once only once found an error that was in the artist's favor. So some kind of isolated probability storm going on there, it looks like the kind of thing that we should definitely be able to, to, to look into more closely. So we do require transparency when it comes to protecting investors, right? Like if there is a, 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 a material matter that's going to affect a share price, the company's got all kinds of reporting obligations and, um, and so on. So why do we do that for investors and not for artists? Well, the answer is obvious, right? It's the same answer as always. The purpose of a system, as Stafford Beer says, is what it does. And um, whenever we want to understand why something works the, the way that it does, despite really obvious shortcomings, the trick is to look at who's winning and who's losing. Um, we do have some some great uh, green shoots about how we can introduce transparency here. In the EU in 2019, they introduced the Digital Single Market Directive, um, which mandates that artists and performers in each member state get new rights to find out how their works are being used, what kind of revenues coming in, and how their share is calculated. Um, Implementation is tricky because in each each member state, um, these powerful lobbyists are, are, are white anting the process to to undermine the transparency that is actually required. But it's absolutely um, you know, a, a step in the right direction. Uh, next, interoperability, of course, fundamental to the open ethos, and it's going to be absolutely critical to defeating choke point capitalism in both sort of narrow and broader senses of it. Digital rights management is obviously a key way to achieving a choke point, to locking your, your users and your suppliers in so that you can convert one of those supposedly temporary market advantages to something more enduring. Um, we saw, saw that with Audible. Every Audible book has digital rights management attached to it, which is why we did not um, release choke point capitalism as an audio 
book on on Audible. It's available um, on all other platforms. So we had to we had to self finance that because the rights to the audio book weren't worth anything if you weren't going to make it available on Audible. So we kick started it. And um, we had it read by an amazing reader, Stefan Rudnicki, who read Ender's Game as well. Some of you might have listened to that. Um, and um, we did a few little stunts as well. There is a little part of it that's available on Audible. We just um, we we packaged the standalone chapter about their terrible, terrible abuses as a standalone Audible exclusive and made that available. Um, uh, we were a bit shocked the day we were looking at this and we'd sold a few hundred copies of it. So I feel a little bad about that, but, um, we, we did that. And we also, we, we took the, the chapter on Spotify's most egregious abuses and we made that available on Spotify as well. Um, the reason why these lock-ins work is nobody wants to split up their, their libraries. Um, nobody wants to split up their friend group, you know, um, leaving Facebook doesn't just mean you leave Facebook. It means that you, you risk um, losing access to your social networks, your communications networks. Um, I haven't had Facebook since 2008 or 2009. And there's a lot of barbecues that you end up just not knowing about because um, you're not there where everybody else is getting the invitation. But I would argue we need more than a right to, to bypass DRM. We need positive rights as well, um, rights of access, rights. Uh, and so this is maybe a broader sense of interoperability. And Corey's called for a right to exit, freedom to exit, um, which is the right to leave a sinking platform while continuing to stay connected to the communities that you left behind, enjoy the media and apps that you bought, and preserve the data that you created. The open ethos uh, as well has such a strong focus on equity. There's very little room for the predatory middlemen that are positioning themselves to um, um, sit between um, um, uh, audiences and creators or, or buyers and sellers in order to sort of um, use their power to mediate access to extract um, an unfair share of value. Um, what open access really does is promote equity regardless of socioeconomic advantage or disadvantage. Um, and that's that's really missing in the creative industries where we do see that even if you do have enough transparency to find out what's going on, you might, um, you, you, and, and, and everything is above board, you're still very likely to lack the bargaining power to be able to, to strike a, a, a fair deal. It's only a few superstars like Taylor Swift who can really negotiate on those um, standard terms of contract, term, terms of, of, of doing business. And we can also find inspiration to, to, to find out how we can introduce more equity and widen choke points out through the DSM directive again. Um, that mandated, again, um, uh, minimum rights, uh, effectively minimum wages for creative workers in the form of um, um, rights to fair and reasonable remuneration. And it's really exciting to see the Australian government in the uh, incredible cultural policy that was um, published in uh, January, I think it was January, uh, to see that um, they're also talking about, you know, maybe having awards for creative workers, bringing more of the um, the ideas and, and protections of employment law to treat arts work as, as real work, which of course that it is. Um, in the EU as well, we see another way in which they're levelling the playing field in terms of equity with use it or lose it rights. Um, creative workers are often, and, and you know, many other kinds of workers, including programmers, um, required to sign away their copyrights as a condition of, of doing business. Uh, but those, those copyrights last a really long time. So in the case of computer code, it's your entire lifetime plus another 70 years after that. It's like three generations of people that have to kind of figure that out. Um, nearly always um, the life of the copyright outlasts the commercial interest in the work. And so this is where it can be really uh, helpful to have reversion rights. You have an entitlement to get the work back where it's not being used. If it's not being reasonably exploited, um, then the, the progenitor of that work should have the right to claw it back. And then that promotes not only new ways of getting creators paid, but also helps us um, promote access. And that's um, something that we've been doing with the Untapped project that I think some of you are familiar with 
where we, um, another lockdown project where we decided to create our own publishing house and republish 161 formerly out of print but really culturally important Australian books. We wanted to make sure that they weren't going to be lost and um, they, um, you know, they included something like half a dozen um, former winners of the Miles Franklin Award, some amazing, amazing books. Um, and uh, the, the the writers, when they they were able to exercise out of print clauses to to get those rights back, they were able to then get a new revenue stream because we were licensing them, um, making them available as eBooks, so license them for sale, but also for use in libraries. And we were ensuring access to a new group of people. So we can see that by improving equity, we can find ways of of win win making the pie bigger um, for everybody. Um, I also want to talk about stewardship as a really uh, what is something that I think of as a core value of the open movement and something that really sets it apart because you know stewardship is distinct from ownership and of course ownership is you know fundamental to enforcing things like copyleft licenses but the community ethos very often is one of thinking about how to protect and preserve um, um, and, and ensure continuity for, for, for future people um, of different kinds of work. And um, this, I think, is why the open movement is so closely tied, so closely aligned to the preservation movement. Um, and it also makes me think of this as quite like a, a First Nations idea of of stewardship, like stewardship of the land, um, in in ways that that do try and promote sustainability and um, and health and 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 um, ongoing viability, which is very very different to the very extractive model of ownership that we've been um, talking about so far today. And so, I think when we when we Th start thinking about stewardship, then it n it nudges us to think about well, who's got what and who needs what for this to continue on a sustainable footing, and what we we it 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 it, it really brings it so close to home that the arts industries in particular, but other industries too, are becoming less and less sustainable. So if we want to keep having them, we're going to have to think about ways of doing it differently. And so we talk about this about, you know, again, like how ways in which you can use things like reversion rights um, to, to, to both, in, in, uh, you know, to fulfill copyright's twin aims of helping recognize and reward creators, but also to ensure the widest possible access to knowledge and culture. Um, and self-determination is another one that I wanted to talk about as being really critical and another core open value because open gives people opportunities to to look and to tinker and to see if something doesn't work for them and to make it different so that it does work for them so to change the material conditions um, of, of of your life and your environment and the corporations who uh, are so determinedly choke pointing their industries are deliberately depriving us of the ability to do exactly that um, whether it's by locking us into their silos, their walled gardens, or whether it's by eliminating comp competitors who might offer us a different choice that could work better for our needs. And of course, if we've learned anything from the open movement, it's that people have a lot of very different needs. One size doesn't fit all in, in almost any category. Corey puts it really beautifully, I think, when he says competition isn't about making the market efficient. It's not even about choice. It's about self-determination, weakening the power of intermediaries who would otherwise take away our ability to lead our creative and human lives in a way of our choosing, who would and do force us to arrange our lives to benefit their shareholders, no matter how badly that works for us. Now, big bugbear of mine, I don't think humans are very good at figuring out what are the conditions for a good life. If we, did, if we were, then we would definitely not have email. Um, and don't, don't, don't even talk to me about Slack, which is just Canadian email, and you're not going to convince me otherwise. Um, you know, it, it's apocryphal, the idea that 
that frogs in a slowly warming pan of water won't jump out if it's warmed up slowly enough. They get hot and they jump out. Humans, though, I think, um, really are like those frogs um, in that we can... We, we are very resilient, we're very adaptable, but that means that as life kind of steadily gets worse and the conditions of that get worse, we don't necessarily jump out of the pot. But I think it is clear that too much of our lives are not around making the world work for us as humans to, to lead good lives, to flourish, but around um, maximum profits for investors and maximum con- um, extraction. And so the ability to change those conditions um, really seems critical to widening choke points out. Um, I uh, can see that um, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll talk quite briefly just this last little bit. I'm going to talk about collectivity as well. And this is, I think, the, my, um, my favourite part of the book and the, the, certainly the most inspiring and hopeful part. There were so many amazing stories that we found of how even like the most atomized and powerless people were able to, by working together, um, improve and, um, and and even flip the tables on the really powerful corporations that they, they had been locked into. Um, one of my favorite stories is around the Uber drivers who were, you know, deprived of, of access to justice because they were locked into contracts that prohibited them from bringing class actions. Individual lawsuits were just not feasible and they were locked into um, mandatory commercial arbitration. The mandatory commercial arbitration works really well for these firms when um, it's just a couple of people bringing them, but these thousands and thousands of Uber drivers coordinated to all bring um, binding commercial arbitration um, and matters all at the same time. And Uber ran, went running to the court to say, oh my goodness, this is so unfair. They ended up having to settle with their drivers for almost $150 million, which is probably more expensive than it would have been had it been a class action. Um, the Writers Guild of America strike was also just such a um, uh, such an uh, such a, a great story. We were working with people like David Goodman, who was the president of the, of the guild at the time the strike was going on. There were um, bull abuses in the um, the talent agency arena in Hollywood. Four big agencies had um, kind of cornered the market for all the talent and they'd set up these new structures so that they were um, lining their own nests, feathering their own nests at the, um, at the sake of the creators that they were supposed to represent. And in the golden age of television, writers were seeing that their conditions were worsening and worsening. And so, um, you know, they, they thought they couldn't do anything about this. And then finally they realised that the the um, the agencies that only had the power that the writers gave them, because you can have Hollywood without agents, but you can't have Hollywood without writers. And so they came up with a new code of conduct that got rid of all of these abuses. And they said, um, that's it. Um, we are going to... Um, fire everybody who doesn't comply with that code of conduct. And then in a single week, 7,000 Hollywood um, writers fired their agents. And it was brutal. Like they ground this strike out for 22 months, but eventually everybody rolled over and they they changed the conditions of their work. Um, but more broadly, I think we need a, a movement. Um, and that's that's the, the, the most critical thing. Um, the open movement is, I mean, this conference, I suppose, more than anything, the people who've been brought together for it and like the, the other conference, but I think it's really, it's growing over time and spreading and expanding and bringing in different people. Um, we see that open is a movement, um, that the folks who are developing free and open source software are part of the same fight as the ones um, promoting open government or open education, open hardware, the, um, the, the, the gallery and library and museum folks who are working on opening up their collections um, and bringing the open ethos um, to, to, to development and access. But I really want to uh, end by by um, encouraging us to see that the open movement is also part of a broader movement against corporate concentration, that this too is part of the same fight. Um, the strip mining of creative workers is like 
part of that broader project in service of oligarchy that um, that we're all subject to. It's not just you know independent creators and producers who are being screwed over, but it's almost everybody. And if they haven't come for you yet, it's just because they haven't had time. We we have a section in the right right at the end of the book where we say that you know the the, the tech industry t- treats its techies better than it treats the arts workers because it has to, right? But as soon as they find a way or as soon as the conditions change where they don't have to, then the techies are going to find themselves in exactly the same position. And we read that out at South by Southwest on Friday, and we felt very prescient because, you know, um, uh, you know, there's blood on the walls. There are tens of thousands of tech workers who are suddenly um, pr- uh, out of work and, and struggling to figure out what's going to happen next. And so um, things get worse for all of us when corporations shake us down. Um when wealth gets funneled inexorably towards the rich, where we are deprived of of the ability um, to self-determine, to change the the conditions of our life by tinkering, um, we, we don't have any transparency to find out, you know, what is being done, what is being taken to us, um, and we're all part of the same fight. But people ask me, people often ask me, what is it? Um, but what is it? How do we start? How do we start to change? Because you know it, it feels like such a big project, um, and that's and that's absolutely right. Um, you know, if if you want to get to a sustainable, fair world where there's enough for everybody instead of um, violent extraction by a very few over the very many, um, if you want to get there, you wouldn't start. You wouldn't start from here, but we have to start from here, and we are starting from here. And I think everybody in in the open movement is doing exactly what I think is the key, which is to, to build connection and community, right? That's, that's the, that's the, the, the crux of it. It's the, um, this extractive, um, neoliberal, uh, capitalist economic system is designed to isolate us from one another, um, to keep us disconnected so that we have that hollow emptiness inside of us. And that's not a bug. It's, it's a feature. Right, we're supposed to feel empty inside because then we will fill it with ever more production and ever more consumption. So, building community, having conversations with people, understanding their fight and how it fits in with yours. Um, these are all these are all the first bites towards uh, eating the elephant. Um, and I'm so grateful to everybody who is here today and active in these movements for everything that you do towards that. Um, Thank you so much for listening and for all of the support for the book and for inviting me along to speak to you tonight.